And Ben, you mentioned fraud. Um, that's a good. Uh, that's a good so sort of segue into looking at claims and then looking at, uh, as you like to call it, suspicious activity. Not using the F word necessarily, but using suspicious activity. How can location intelligence help in, in fraud detection? I think there's there's a, a, a whole number of ways, whether it starts at the policy uh, and looking where at the address misrepresentation type stuff that goes on where, the, uh, uh, you know, some, this is actually the public using the uh, location-based information, knowing that premiums are really high in a certain area, a certain mm -hmm. postal code misrepresenting, getting a lower premium, and then they get the claim comes in, and now you got to decide kind of what's happened. You mean you're driving to work four hours every day uh, from, right. from, yeah. from yeah. Ottawa, <laughs> just picking Ottawa? <laughs> Um, so, That's so, so, normal day so yeah. <laughs> so it's it's this 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 type of, of um, kind of an example on the policy side. On the on the on the claim side, um, I mean, we are looking for anomalous behavior or statistically unusual behavior. So, uh, bringing in another dimension like location into that analysis, you know, is there a, a prevalence of a, a of a certain. Um, um, set of circumstances occurring in a particular area. Are people traveling suspiciously long distances to go to a specific clinic rather than the ones that are within a certain proximity? And so doing any kind of analysis like that is, is hugely uh, beneficial as a supplementary exercise to, uh, uh, to normal fraud uh, investigative techniques. Can location and intelligence uh, can help in both auto property yep. and I, I suppose even in potentially with liability with slip and falls if it's a location somewhere and, and someone says, well, I wasn't I wasn't actually at that location, and you can pinpoint the exact location of where, where things can happen. And, and I think it's absolutely, uh, and it's it, the the part that I would stress is it's not necessarily where the initial incident occurred, but all the subsequent activities in the life cycle of that. So so again, looking at um, uh, where that person went to to get uh, um, referrals and treatments, and where they ended up ultimately in that kind of location based uh, uh, right. type stuff. Again, these are these are all supplementary and and, and additional pieces of information that have to be investigated, but right. and aren't necessarily indicators, but they can be powerful indicators. Right, right, right. And do you think this is more prevalent for opportunistic or more organized um, suspicious activity? Well, I, I think the the techniques can be used regardless of whether it's opportunistic or or um, um, organized and premeditated. But the the kind of um, uh, subsequent events uh, would probably be more premeditated and organized. That's interesting. Yeah, fraud, because you could see that sometimes a location will pop up, uh, whether it's a, it could be a, you just mentioned a rehab clinic, it could be a P.O. box address that, that get, it sort of, it keeps coming up and, and maybe in the past insurers wouldn't have been able to connect a yeah. dot, but now that, that, that they have some more of that data, they can, they can do that. Very interesting, very interesting. What about some of the challenges in getting this actually operated? We mentioned legacy systems, but to actually get it into the hands of frontline decision makers, what what are the biggest what are the biggest uh, impediments or obstacles that are out there? What's what's standing in the way of, of this moving forward? Is it just legacy systems? It starts with with the, the data capture. So where are you getting the data? It's how it's moving through your system, which is the legacy issue. But it's all sorts of policy and procedure decisions uh, around. Um, what are the new rules for using that data to make decisions? So you get an insight that suggests some, something. Right. Um, has, has the organization embraced that, embedded that, to train individuals to use that in a consistent way across the organization? So on a case-by-case -case basis, um, it's, it's useful. So on an individual claim, you can have uh, more or less sophisticated investigators using uh, that insight in different ways. But I think if you're looking at really impacting an organization, you have to embed that uh, throughout the organization. So it's a design issue. Mm -hmm. Anyone else want to? I think to, uh, if you move the backward step too, I think we still got some big brother issues and, and bad privacy issues to deal with that haven't been yeah. solved yet. So um, I think there's some barriers there for sure. Well, on the, fraud, yeah. well. on the yeah, fraud side, hopefully the, the S4 bill that just yeah. passed is, is going to help everybody do more. Yeah, but that's, I mean, talking about Big Brother and fraud, I mean, uh, the, 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 the whole arrival of, of telematics and telematic devices give us so much data uh, and, and, and we can uncover what ha happened in, in, in the claim situation. We can, we can find out the real story from yeah. all these data uh, and, uh, and come back to your, your point about Big Brother. Uh, lots of advantages by doing that, but of course you also have to to, uh, to respond to some of the ethic uh, uh, questions around around Big Brother. 
the right for, for me, I love telematics because it's, a, it's yeah. actually an anti it's, it's an yeah. anti fraud indicator because there's yeah. no fraudster that's actually going to go and volunteer <laughs> to sign up for a service that gives me more data about them. So if you got telematics, you're probably not a fraudster. <laughs> Say that there's also a learning curve in terms of changing the way that you're looking at this new data and how you're going to make decisions going forward. And so I guess if you were if historically, you're always looking at, and I come back to sort of FSA codes, but if all of your historical analysis and research and all of your current processes internally are all based on FSA territories, now you introduce this new way of thinking about the information, well, you almost have to, to a certain extent, redo all your historical in this new model so that it can make sense and you can make some better decisions. So there's a lot of, in, a lot of work and sort of that change management that's yeah. required. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, you have to redo some of the stuff, but, but, but also in different tools because the, the yeah. tools of yesterday are not capable of, of handling that amount of data. So you have also to, to make a, a huge investment in, in, in tools and yeah. systems and making them uh, integrate them. So, uh, yeah. So from the application in terms of commercial versus personal, right? When you have uh, lower volume, fewer instances or transactions that you're dealing with and you're trying to make real-time decisions or location-based decisions, it may be easier um, for underwriters and, and adjusters to look at that when you think about high volume and, and you've got a whole number of, um, uh, you know, uh, policies to look at on a daily basis and, and adjudicate and, and underwrite. Uh, it just changes the game. How do you make it super easy, simple, intuitive, served up, you know, uh, real time in order to enable that and, and really scale it? Uh, that's that's the challenge at hand because um, that's, that's still a ways away from thinking about making that happen. And so it goes back to the platform and how well it integrates, but also how do you really make it easy for the users to adopt it in a, in a meaningful way? About automating as much of it as yeah, you can and leaving absolutely. only the exceptions to be dealt with by individuals. Yeah. And then so you really have to believe in the model that you're building to, to, to allow that sort of straight through processing um, on this new base, on this mm -hmm. new location-based information. Well, and that really does require leadership from the top and cultural change. So we've been doing really quite a lot of research around innovation in insurers and around half the um, insurers that we've been surveying. You said those in the same sentence. <laughs> oh, well, exactly. I, I rest my case. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> around half the insurers will will tell you that their business model is already being disrupted by technology, but are half of them doing anything about it? Well, the answer is, I think, Doug, you've answered that question. <laughs> and it's the ones who've got the leadership, who've got that sort of test and learn culture. But I think Dennis made a great point yeah. earlier. It's not a question of getting more profitable. It's about stopping erosion by, by staying, up, yeah. keeping, keeping up with everyone else. Mm. And it's going to become an anti-item at some point where you just, you have to be doing it.